Hello. Thank you for joining the Horasis panel. I'm Martin Schulze, and I run the art nonprofit Public Delivery. It is a platform for collaboration and information, and also one of the most visited editorial websites with content published in both English and Chinese. Today, we speak about the role of female artists in the contemporary art world. And to discuss this, we have five speakers joining us. Because the topic is so broad, we will focus on solutions, trying to understand how a change could actually take place to empower female artists and give them more visibility. We will cover a wide range of topics from creating supportive environments to the art market. We will also see that the situation has been improving over the last few years. Still, much more needs to be done and there are huge challenges for female artists to overcome. And for ways to improve this, we will listen to the panelists. I will briefly introduce each speaker then each one will provide the input for a couple of minutes, and then we will join a discussion. The first three speakers are artists, and even though their works look quite different, they all use a unique sense of humor, which is clearly visible in their art pieces. First, we have Berlin-based artist Robert Barter. He often turns everyday objects into art pieces. Many of his artworks are interactive, some geared towards children, and they always use a special sense of humor. Second, we have Nancy Calif, an artist based in San Francisco. She creates large paintings full of incredible details, which take her months to complete. She also often uses humor in her works to speak about issues facing society. The following speaker is Roxana Halls, an artist based in London. Similar to Nancy, she also creates painting, paintings that require a lot of work and often use humor. She's also the founder of a female art collective, which she will present today. The fourth speaker is Dr. Christina Simeon. She runs an art gallery called Tiny Griffin Gallery in Nuremberg, Germany, and is also active as a curator. Christina mostly works with Romanian artists and besides Germany has many projects in Romania, her native country. The fifth and last, last speaker is Dr. Marina Veles Vago. She's a lecturer in fine art at the Norwich University of the Arts and ICE, University of Cambridge. Marina wears many hats. She's also the founder of her residency program, works as a curator as well as an artist, and has published several books. So first, we will start with Robert. Please give us your first input, Robert. Hey, um, glad to be here. Um, I might introduce myself a little bit more detailed if I can do that. Um, I was born in 75 in Prague in Czech Republic and uh, went in 1984 uh, to Germany with my parents, uh, where I studied fine arts in art school in Academy of, in Munich. And I did my master in San Francisco in the SFAI. And I work since 2005, let's say 2006, as an uh, independent artist, mostly dealing with uh, sculpture, objects, and installation art. Um, and just lately, I was I was asked uh, what are or what what my sculptures installations are about, and my answer was that I actually wanted to be become a performance artist because um, I failed in that. So I started to do works that um, need the visitor to become a part of the piece, so to finish the actual piece um, in itself. Um, talking about the topic, yeah. Um, in my opinion, uh, the last, yeah, if you look back at the last hundred years, so not even starting at the contemporary, but in modern art, um, female artists in numbers were just a few, as we know, just a very few. And in that occasion, I think um, a lot of things changed to the better. But looking at in the number of, let's say, curators or gallerists, um, female curators and gallerists um, and comparing that uh, to the numbers of professionally working artists in the world, then still the number of the female artists is pretty small. Um, and if you look at the successful thing, um, yeah, I don't like the word successful because it always employs um, financial growth or, um, you know, how many b and somebody had, some, how many galleries somebody's represented by, or even if re represented by galleries. So the word success here uh, might be misleading in terms of um, how many visitors somebody had in a museum. I think success would be, in my opinion, more how much people you can reach and not, uh, not, not in numbers, sorry, not how much people you can reach, but how 
let's say how how good the visitors are that can reach your art through either even if it's just a book or if it's an exhibition actual exhibition um, if it's an off space if it's a gigantic museum or a small museum uh, if it's also international wide because here in berlin where i live so 15 years you have a lot of artists showing just in berlin and being busy just in berlin but nowhere else so and that's also questionable if that is something you might be looking for as a career as um in terms of also calling it success i would admire much more artists especially in the younger years when they don't have so many shows but they try to get involved internationally in let's say other artists female or male artists work together and ask also about the same issues or the same problems that in one country are sometimes repeated in another country or problems we don't have or we don't know yet and meeting other artists internationally to exchange those um i think yeah that's that's something that i would call interesting um interesting point right nancy do you want to go next sure um thank you martin and uh esteemed fellow panelists i'm grateful to be here to share it with you today um I'm a visual reporter, and for four decades, I've been creating what I call peoplescapes. So they're oil, sculpture, fabric, found objects on canvas, addressing social, political, and spiritual issues facing our society. Um, through juxtaposition, dimension, and irony, I weave together narratives about contemporary life. Um, my work tries to highlight um, our universal commonality, but I also depict our uniqueness and I delve into the good, the bad, the ugly, the dark and the light of the human condition. Um, art saved my life. And so now I create art through the lens of service. Uh, I'd like to share my images. Is that okay if we go now? Um, sure. The first one, the, I'm going to share four. The first painting is called Deaf, Dumb and Blind. And this is oil on canvas, 36 by 48 inches. You know, women in the arts through history have been limited and controlled by the male-dominated culture. And knowledge and expression are power. Our senses can be impeded. Access to education can be suppressed. But the mind, imagination, and, and perception cannot be bound. And creativity can ooze from the smallest access points. Sculptor Louise Nevelson, who was actually born in a part of Russia that is now the country of Ukraine, says, quote, the freer that women become, the freer men become, because when you enslave someone, you are enslaved. Next slide, please. This painting is called Still Waiting. It's oil on canvas, 36 by 48 inches. Betty Friedan, the iconic author of The Female Mystique, points womankind to the destiny across the bridge of empowerment. As she progresses, the crocodile bites at her heels. The triple deity, which is creator, preserver, destroyer, powerhouses Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and slaughtered Benazir Bhutto are presented be before the world stage, which is ruled by testosterone. The women's movement has granted our right to vote. We're integrated in science, technology, politics, business, sports, and art, yet the fight for gender equality has not passed history. I mean, currently the U.S. Supreme Court is poised to strip women further of their reproduction rights by denying abortion. Gloria Steinem, political activist and journalist, says, quote, it takes 200 years to make change, and we were only at the first part of that time frame. Next image, please. This painting is called The Dressing Room. It's oil sculpture fabric found objects on canvas. Women have to adapt, perform many roles, and wear various disguises to embody self-expression. Through perseverance, we manifest and hone our crafts. We play the game. We fight our way to be taken seriously, seen, heard, and equally valued. Looking in the mirror in the back is, I refer to Madame X by Singer Sargent. It's drew controversy at the time as, as she was described as a professional beauty, a term used to refer to women who use personal skills to advance themselves personally. Maintaining control of the scene is the man. He looks at his watch. Time is money. <clears throat> Judy Chicago, an activist American artist, 
use being use being a female in a mom in a male dominated art world as the subject of her work. Her large installation, The Dinner Party, is a monument to women's history and accomplishments. 39 place settings are dedicated to prominent women throughout history, and 999 names are inscribed in the base of the table. She says, quote, I'm trying to make art that relates to the deepest and most mythic concerns of humankind. And I believe that at this moment in history, feminism is humanism. Next image, please. This is my final image. This is called the push and pull of evolution. This is oil on canvas and it's 30 by 40 inches. As humanity evolves, there seems to be the pull of resistance to change and the fear of when releasing old ways to make room for the new. Using the design of a mandala, I incorporate spiritual, scientific, and social realms in our ever-changing circumstances to depict evolution. Symbols of alchemy and transformation represent the invisible forces. All that we are, all that we share, all that we represent in this transitory visit on Earth and all that we leave behind. The drama of our lives will fade with time, and if we're lucky, our work will remain. There's a Sanskrit saying, quote, as the mind, so the person, bondage or or liberation are in our minds. If you feel bound, you are bound. If you feel liberated, you are liberated. Things outside neither bind or liberate you. Only your attitude towards them can do that. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Roxana, uh, I think you're next. Hi, that was so wonderful, Nancy. Um, hi, I'm Roxana Halls. I'm a London-based figurative painter. Um, I've been a practicing artist now for 30 years, I would say, seriously. Um, and that still seems rather remarkable to me that that's even, that was ever a possibility. I come from a working class background, largely self-taught. I didn't go to art school. Um, I didn't... Uh, I didn't have the opportunities that quite a lot of artists do have. And uh, although some of the landscape has shifted in the time that I've been practicing as an artist, it's still very uncommon for me to encounter anyone coming from my background who has sustained a career in the arts. And that's been a cent- that is a central concern of mine. How on earth someone like myself Um, I mean, I'm an unusual character because I've always been extremely determined and I've never felt that I've had much of an option in life. Um, It's felt very much a vocation to me to make art as as, uh, old fashioned as that sounds. Um, But you shouldn't have to be the most determined person (laughs) imaginable to be able to have a career in the arts, because what we're talking about really is amplifying voices and making it possible for a variety of voices to be heard. Just to give you a sense of my work, Martin, if you wouldn't mind sharing the screen now. Yes. So, um, so my work is held in various private and public collections in the UK and internationally. Um, this painting is in the collection of the Science Museum in the UK. Um, as you can see, this is an NHS worker um, this was produced as part of an, an incredible collaborative project called Portraits for NHS Heroes. Uh, I would recommend anyone goes and reads about that project at some point if they're interested. Um, next slide. This is a portrait of mine of Horse MacDonald, a really remarkable singer-songwriter. This is held in the collection of National Galleries of Scotland. Um, next slide, please. Um, the portrait of mine of an eminent philosopher a professor of philosophy, no longer with us, sadly, and this is held in the collection of St. Catherine's College in Oxford. Next slide, please. So those are some of my portraits, um, which are held in public collections, but I'm best known for work like this. So uh, this is called Laughing While Leaving. Um, So I'm best known for images of women who are run laughing from catastrophic situations of their own making. Um, I'm deliberately um, open about the interpretation of these paintings for a very specific purpose. Uh, I use beauty and humour as a trap for the unwary um, because I think it's an interesting and useful strategy 
to make it possible for people to to engage with certain themes which they may otherwise find somewhat let's say alienating or troublesome but i think it also creates an opportunity for people to examine their own lives and examine the ways in which they may be um curtailed by their own, by the circumstances of their lives um i often describe these images of women fleeing traps by whatever means necessary and that is a very pertinent question is it not for so many women how do you escape the trap of your life what would it mean if you were entirely free what would it mean if you could escape escape your circumstances if you could scroll just scroll through the images one by one now just give you some more further ideas of some of my work this is a piece of myself and a friend with whom i've made a lot of work it's called laughing while looting um perhaps we're looting the house behind but perhaps perhaps that swag bag is full of ideas perhaps it's the work that we've created together i rather like not homing in necessarily on what i think the interpretation of the work should be but rather what it suggests is there rather thought experiment rather than anything that's very particular symbolism um and i of, i've often said that when you don't come from a background where you are supported um financially and and where you have the benefit of social networks nepotism cultural capital uh, very often to make a life feels like it's an equivalent to um undertaking a heist it it involves a lot of stealth you know it is rather like a bank robbery sometimes just to have your own life it's not easy being an artist um next image I work collaboratively collaboratively with my models so I don't like to impose a system of working necessarily on the people that I work with I insist that we work together and we storyboard together and that there is a sense of collaborative purpose next slide so one of the models in this painting is what a, a, a brilliant writer and art historian called Marie and Mansco and myself her and artists Rebecca Fontaine Wolf, uh Wendy Elia and Adelaide de Moa have co-founded an intersectional feminist art collective called Infems and together we are trying to um we're trying to make a certain shift we're trying to make a dent in the in the normal run of things by creating collaborative exhibitions touring exhibitions and creating spaces uh for symposiums and discussions that are very honest and that seek to engage younger people diverse people uh female artists female identifying artists trying to engage with them and trying to create opportunities for them to exhibit and to talk honestly and openly about their experiences next slide please that's that's it that's it that's, that's me So I would like to tell you more about Infems during the run of things but I think that's my 3 minutes. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, you are next. Good evening. I'm a curator and gallerist based in Nuremberg, Germany. I work a lot in Eastern Europe uh with artists and collective of artists uh related to Eastern Europe and especially to Romania. and um i'm doing much more curating work than gallery in the last years um also curating large gatherings like uh, two international biennials and um following a course in art and finance with sotheby's institute of art it came to my mind uh to analyze the market from the women's artist point of view and it might be a very good moment to talk about acting for equal means also in the uh, art market and if we can uh, start with the slides please um last year was actually the first year the next please where the annual turnover totals generated by women artists collectively hit the glass ceiling of over 1 billion uh, US dollars that was in 2021 um, and uh, it's an important thing although the market stays at around 60 billion dollars 
for a couple of years now, since 2003, 2004, with the exception of 2008. Um, the women, um, the, the turnover generated by women uh, artists has grown and grown, and it was a milestone the last year. Um, next, please. Uh, one of the important thing, and also the next um, slide, uh, is that in top 500 global artists on the Global Art Market Report, uh, by annual turnover, last year were seven women artists amongst the 100 most successful artists at auctions. And two of them are still living and active, Yayoi Kusama and <laughs> Cecily Brown. And it's such a big change when one would look 10 years ago, they were just two and they were already um, part of history. Um, and that's, that's good news, I would say. Next, please. The, it's um, an interview with the um, head or the brain behind the art market report by Art Basel. It's uh, Dr. Claire McAndrew, McAndrew, and she said that although the share of women's artists in global exhibition grew, it grew very, very slowly from 25% in 2000, so at the beginning of the century, to only 33% in 2018. And the prices of the artworks created by women artists are still very small, and that is a problem and you can find it that in the art market report. Next, please. In 2021, a most successful artist in the contemporary artist ranking by Art Fox, so based on um, exhibitions in uh, uh, museums, solo shows, group shows, um, uh, biennials, uh, in the top 100, we will find 23 women. And out of them, two are in top 10, Cindy Sherman and Louise Bourgeois. And that is also something new and, and very, uh, very good as a news. Next, please. Um, we all know that Chile Alemani, the curator of the current Venice Biennale, invited more than 80% women artists. And she says in an interview, it's important to know that it's been 127 years of an, in, of an unequal representation since the Venice Biennale began. And then she continues, uh, I can do an amazing show with 80 to 100% women artists instead of the opposite, because it's always been the opposite and nobody's ever questioned that. Um, next, please. I, I did a very summer case study about the Yayoi Kusama uh, price index. It's very interesting to know that the greatest growth in median value of uh, the works of an artist, almost 1,000% in the last 20 years, um, are the works of Yayoi Kusama. Uh, she is the most frequently sold female artist and realized a turnover of almost 1 billion million US dollars in, only in public action. So we speak about the secondary market. We don't speak about the primary market. But it's very interesting to note from almost 1,000 artworks sold. So the median value is not necessarily very, very high. She has different type of artworks some of them multiples for different price ranges. Next, please. Um, in the first three months of this year, uh, Cecily Brown was the top selling female artist at each of top three auction houses, so Christie's, Sotheby's and Phillips. And she um, holds some other records as well, the highest in the individual price achieved by a female artist almost 6 million US dollars, and an overall highest dollar total over $17 million. And to close my introduction, I think that tonight, next please, next slide, 
It's a historic night and the next. But Sotheby's, exactly when we, uh, when we speak, um, next, I'm trying to keep with, a, with a three minutes. It's, a, it's an interesting um, sale. It's called The Now, and it's quite historic. And tonight, The Now includes nearly 60% of the works that are created by women artists. And the first 10 lots of tonight's auction, the most anticipated works in a public auction, are also by women artists. While we speak, uh, we might expect the results. Sotheby's, although 60% of the works are made by women artists, expect that only 30% of the turnover will be made by these works. So it's still a way to do. Thank you very much. Great. I think uh, now it's your turn, Marina. Yes, um, thank you very much. So it's my presentation turn. Um, I'm Marina Vélez, Dr. Marina Vélez Vago. I was born in Argentina, but I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. And um, I, I'm going to share with you my, my research. So if you can put the PowerPoint, uh, the, the, the slides, please, Martin. Um, as a good Cambridge girl, I'm going to present the paper. <laughs> So uh, my research is about value in the aesthetic field. I study value in relation to recognition and protection, and I explore its links with social justice and environmental justice through the lens of feminism and sustainability. There is evidence to suggest that what is valued is recognized, and then in turn is protected from erasure. Using value as an indicator of what social groups consider relevant can highlight issues such as women's unpaid labor, employing extractive colonial practices to relate to the environment, or abuse of power in human relationships with other species. The question of the aesthetics of oppression is a question of value. And in this forum, it can be articulated simply by asking if women artists' practices are valued. If we agree that erasure is a form of oppression devised by patriarchal colonizing thinking, which affects indigenous cultures and minorities, wildlife and its habitat, then the struggle of female artists to be recognized is also a form of resistance for other ways of being in the world outside the Western anthropocentric patriarchal canon to be recognized and valued. Next slide, please. So to find a way out of this circle of oppression, I will suggest five strategies for artistic practices. One, develop a career bag or art practice. Two, grab the microphone and say it loudly. Three, do not give up the practice even if the times are not right. Four, organize. Five, insert yourself and other women artists in the picture. Next slide. So develop a career bag practice, strategy one. The first cultural advice was probably a recipient says Elizabeth Fisher in her career back theory of revolution. The earliest cultural inventions must have, have been a container to hold gathered products and some kind of sling or net carrier. To what Ursula Le Guin responds that she doesn't care for retelling the story of the male hunter and all the sticks, spears and swords and the things with which to bash, poke and hit and murder but that she wants to tell a new story, the story about the thing to put things in, the container for the thing contained. For what's the use, she asks, of digging up a lot of potatoes if you have nothing to carry <laughs> potatoes you can't eat <laughs> with you back home? So with, uh, uh, before the tool that forces energy outward, we made the tool that brings energy home. So a carrier bag art practice that brings energy home and tells a new story makes sense to me because, as Donna Haraway says, it matters what stories that we tell stories with. Next slide. So uh, strategy two, grab the microphone and say it loudly, like Barbara Kruger does in this work, borrowing value from the capitalist language of advertising to address media and politics in their native tongue, authoritative and direct. 
So she made this work in uh, 1989 um, w because it, it was marked by numerous demonstrations protecting a new wave of anti-abortion laws in the United States. So this work was produced by Kruger for the group Women's March on Washington in support for reproductive freedom. But the power of this work, as, as we can see, lies in the timeless of its uh, bold and loud declaration. Next slide. So strategy three, do not give up your practice, even if the times are not right. When Hilma Afklint, which we can see here, um, began creating radically abstract paintings in 96, years before Vasily Kandinsky, Kazimir Balevich, and Piet Mondrian um, created um, um, abstract paintings. Um, so, but the problem is that Afklint uh, um, kept these paintings la largely private because she was convinced that the world uh, was not yet ready to understand her work. Mm, and she stipulated that uh, the paintings wouldn't be shown uh, for 20 years following her death. Nevertheless, she carried on her practice, creating extraordinary abstract paintings, which were, in her words, sometimes commissioned by the spiritual world. Her work remained unseen until 1986, and since then, they have received the attention they deserve. Next slide. Organize. Create a sisterhood, get value in numbers and in mutual support. Like in this, um, uh, uh, the, this um, collective in South Africa, IKEA, um, made up ex exclusively of black female artists. They created their collective because they felt overlooked by the commercial galleries in their hometowns and they hope to overthrow the idea of art as a man's game. They uh, say that naming the, co the collective after the cloth African women used to cover their heads when carrying water vessels is a signifier of both the strength and burden with the daily life, uh, daily realities they face as uh, young black women. And the, this collective investigates themes of womanhood, strength and protest with the hope to pave the way for more gender equality in the art market. And next slide. Uh, final strategy, insert yourself and other women artists in the picture, like Spanish artist Maria Jimeno in her performance work, Queridas Viejas. She explains of this work. Mm, Queridas Viejas is a performance in which I include women artists in A History of Art by Gombrich, a book with which so many generations have studied all over the world since 1950 and still do today. This book is the icon of the established canon that defines what art with capital A is. This book did not include a single woman artist up to the year 1966, I repeat, 1966, when only one uh, female artist was added, called it. Next slide. And finally, her performance involves ex extending the book by increasing the number of pages, cutting into the headband with a kitchen knife and physically making room for women artists because, as she says, women artists should also be part of the history of art. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I have to say, I really like your five strategies. And to me, I was most surprised by point number three, don't give up. That seems so um, obvious, but once you're in the situation where times are really tough, then it probably, uh, is uh, easier said than done. And Roxana, I would like to ask you, because you have been in this situation, as you mentioned before, uh, when we spoke before this panel, what would you do? Or what would you, a young female artist in this situation about not giving up? Yeah, I think, um, I think try to think about how you can connect with other people is really primary. I think, um, but it does help if there is an infrastructure. It does help if there are organizations and there are collections of people that are, have an urgency about that concern. I mean, again, I'm speaking as a very unusual person and I'm aware that I'm an unusually determined person, but I don't represent um, every uh, female artist who may come from a working class background or an impoverished background who wants to be an artist who thinks that they are an artist. Um, I think we need social networks and we need to to create some kind of a structure, a holding structure 
for other female artists. And that's something that we're trying to do. I mean, I, I think it's very, very easy to get to a point in your life when you can feel the luxury of a certain kind of security and f almost forget where you were and forget how it felt to be where you were. Um, I think that's something that myself and our collective were determined not to do. Um, but I think that does involve reaching and reaching beyond your own networks. And that means effort. It's an effortful thing to do, to not only think in terms of diversity um, within your own networks, but to really seek out people who may be falling through the cracks, as it were, who are unnoticed, who don't have networks available to them. I'm going to give you an example of that, of what we've done. Um, in October last year, we held an exhibition in Leicester, which is a city in the Midlands of the UK. Uh, we deliberately wanted to have a show there because 40% um, of the population there live below the poverty line. Um, you can imagine what that means in terms of social networks and artist networks and how, how, how few opportunities there are for artists, but particularly for female artists who so often are carers, um, have dependents, you know, have so many other things, other concerns, um, very much below concerns for themselves as creative individuals. We held an exhibition in Leicester. We decided to invite artists everywhere we exhibit, we want to invite artists to come and exhibit with us from that area in the UK or beyond. Um, but we don't just want to look at people who you may already know. So we really tried to seek out other artists. So we, we contacted universities. We, did, we, we tried to do outreach uh, activities on social media. Um, we contacted various artist networks to try to find artists who may not be, may not think that opportunities are open to them. And let's face it, that's so true of so many diverse people. Um, they don't. They might hear of something that's happening, but might think it's just not for them. Um, right. so, as well as holding an exhibition, we also held mentoring sessions, and we tried to help artists and tried to give very very honest very thorough advice about how they might improve their practices and how they might improve their networks. So it, right. it's effortful. You have to be able to be prepared to put in effort for people like yourself and certainly for people who are absolutely not like yourself. Right. Thank you so much. Christina, you working on a... Talking about not giving up. Uh, we're part of an international effort uh, led by an international association in Finland, Artists at Risk. And um, the art residency that we have here hosts an Ukrainian artist. At this very moment, Maria Paramonova from Kiev works in the atelier. They are 400 women uh, from the Ukraine, uh, women artists from the Ukraine, helped by artists at risk, and they don't give up. And I've asked the management of artists of risk how many women uh, refugees uh, refugees from Ukraine uh, do they have? And they said almost all of the 400 because the men had to stay and fight in the country. So it's uh, somehow a paradoxical situation when so many women artists from the Ukraine uh, work in art residences all around the world, especially in Europe. And they, they try to thrive and to, um, to have their voice heard. Feel, feel free to jump in whenever you feel like. Maybe, Robert, you can give some input as well. Uh, I think I need to listen more. <laughs> A couple of minutes, maybe. Um, Sorry. It's interesting uh, to, uh, to think about not giving up and to think about the... Um, the support that Roxana was, said, was was talking about, the support that is needed, because yes, as an individual, you can have all the willpower in the world not to give up, but you need that support. And sometimes it's, it's, it might be interesting to think about e ecosystems uh, that are healthy. Um, so collectives are, when, when the collective, when the community can support the uh, female artists to thrive. And as you are trying to do, um, uh, Bea, um, Christina and, and Roxana and everyone who is working in an organization. So to try to create the um, healthy ecosystems uh, in which everybody is supported. 
Um, and I'm reminded also of feminist theories of the uh, Isabel Stenger's uh, theories of the reciprocal capture. Uh, so it's a way of um, making sure that not one trumps, not one culture trumps the other one, not one um, access to uh, certain uh, education or culture or whatever trumps the other one, so that everybody's um, everybody can thrive in the community. Yeah. I want to talk about passion. Um, I was 15 years old when I was uh, admitted to college. Um, I came from a very troubled home, and um, I was given uh, I was given graced with a art education. But what it did for me is it woke it awoke a passion that is deep and penetrating. It's it's a burn in the core, and it sustained me in my life. And with other people, I try to awaken that. Um, before the pandemic, my husband and I had a gallery, and we owned a gallery at, in San Francisco, California, and we um, promoted and exhibited female artists. Uh, we we had readings, we had art shows, we had education. We would um, we would allow give people the opportunity to express themselves, find their passion. And I just think that um, this sustains and there's ways to awaken that. And it gives people confidence if they know that they they can go deep inside and access this. And it becomes a friend of yours, this um, this burn. And uh, I just want to say there's an artist, um, Nikki de St. Fal. She's a French American sculptor. She created the Tarot Garden in Tuscany, Italy. And in 1954, 55, I'm sorry, after seeing Gaudi's Park Well in Barcelona, she started planning her sculpture garden. And she she says, quote, I met both my master and my destiny. I trembled all over. I knew I was meant one day to build my own garden of joy. And 43 years later, she created her tarot garden, which was open to the public. And, um, you know, change takes a long time, but tenacity overcomes limitations. And we can use the suppression of, of female culture to convert that energy into mindful, just, you know, we become mindful warriors and we disallow the victimization. And I think the magic happens in the process. And especially, you know, when women band together uh, with one voice, change happens. Well said. Anyone else wants to contribute something? Robert, you were we you and I were talking about uh, Louis Bourgeois earlier. Yes, in our previous call, and you said that uh, things changed. I was really interested when you talked about the uh, this entire process. Um, you mean um, just about the artist Louis Bourgeois, or um, the entire just process? In general, of... How women took on uh, heavy materials, typically. Uh, associated with artists like Richard Serra, working with steel, working with concrete, and just in general, heavy materials. Um, oh, yeah, I remember. Well, um, I think that, the, well, I, as, as, a ma as a male artist, I still think uh, female artists, sadly, don't have the, how would I describe? Um, If you take different media, let's say performance, we have Amramovich, obviously. So she's one of the best and she's female. But you have sculpture, you have installation, you have painting. And especially in painting, we have the, the boys group, you know, from Richter to the German painters. Um, it's, it's still, they're still more accepted in, in, in history, which is, which is sad. I just discovered probably five, six years ago, um, a painter from New York City in the 70s, 80s. And when you look at her work, I'm, I'm missing the name, sorry. Um, but if you look at her work, it has been uh, 20 years before any painter in the 80s um, made such um, such crazy paintings. And she's right now she's in all the collections, um, but she was discovered after her death. So she wasn't anyone who appreciated um, financial um, or fame, you know, um, in the, in the media or in the newspapers. So, um, yeah, I have to think of her name, but, um, you can, it was seventies, eighties and she did like cutouts. So she cut out paintings and they got three dimensional, very interesting work. Um, and coming back to, because you said, uh, Louis Bourgeois, it was because for me as a, as a child or as a, as a, as a teenager, when I started 
to be interested in artists and, and male, female. Then she stroke me when I was 16, 17 in Prague in National Gallery and I saw my first show. Um, and it struck me because I saw the brutality, uh, the material she deals with, the beauty, um, how well it was done. And that was, in my opinion, much stronger than a Richard Serra, for instance, because it had this, um, yeah, this criticism on the world in her in her pieces. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we're over the time already, so I have to say thank you to everyone and uh, say goodbye also. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. -bye. Been a pleasure.